Okay, everyone, thank you for coming. <laughs> wow, that was louder than I thought. <laughs> Welcome, thanks for coming to Legal Issues in DH. Um, we have a fantastic set of speakers from around the world today. Uh, the format will be 10 minutes each, and then we'll do a Q&A all at the end. Um, so, just to get things started, we have Quinn Dombrowski from Stanford and Lauren Tilton from University of Richmond. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you all for joining us. For, I know everyone saw legal issues on the program and got real excited. So I want to thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, before we do get started, I do want to give one more shout out to all the organizers and program coordinators and everyone here who made this conference possible. It takes a lot of labor, people, invisible labor to make these things happen. So just a huge shout out to everyone, including our volunteers doing all the computers and everything that made this run so seamlessly, so thank you. Uh, so we're gonna talk a bit today about some new developments in uh, digital rights uh, management uh, in the US. But, no. uh, Just is, kidding. Sorry, uh, I might be aiming at the wrong thing. Um, all right, well, so we'll, we'll, we'll start this out. Um, no, no. Keyboard. Oh, oh, thank you. Now it's on. Oh, there we oh, go. There you go. Um, yeah. So a little bit of background and context. Fair use um, in the U.S. is a little bit more capacious than fair dealing um, that we see in, in other countries, including in Europe. Um, you know, and supportive lawyers have for a long time argued that text and data mining uh, falls under fair use um, if you consider the four factors uh, for determining fair use. But until very recently, there were actually no legal rulings related to fair use and DH, um, particularly for for text and data mining. Um, so uh, we're, we're both from the Association for Computers and the Humanities, um, and ACH has a long history of doing advocacy work in this area. Um, we wrote an amicus brief in the Google Books case, and uh, in this last round of, of exemption petitions, uh, we've been deeply involved, um, you know, to, to both as an organization and as a group of scholars, um, you know, trying to make the case for getting an exemption to the DMCA. Uh, the DMCA is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and Section 1201 makes it illegal to circumvent technical uh, protection measures, um, for instance, cracking e-books. Oh, I mean. Yeah, so think about um, if you want to do a corp build your own corpus and you want to get e-books, right, to, in order to actually get to that text, you have to break that digital rights management system, which is not allowed in U.S. law or elite US policy, if you wanna do DVDs, um, you wanna do TV, film, right? They are those pesky DVDs, maybe some of you remember trying to like copy a few for your friends, right? When you tried to break it over for a few remember? Yeah, that, not allowed. Um, and there's some good reasons for this, protecting artists and creators and authors and all of that, but if you're like us and many of the scholars in this field who are excited about maybe what can we learn about 20th century literature or the history of film or cinema or what is, how has the television changed? How have sitcoms changed? How has, how, how can we compare US television to productions from other areas, of, other parts of the world, right? That kind of work makes it really challenging uh, in the U.S. context, particularly for the kinds of um, data that we're excited to work with. And we've even made the case that this has had a perverse impact on scholarship in the U.S. more broadly, where so many people are going to the 19th century because they can access those materials. Um, and so this is, this is actually shaping our field in, in ways that we don't think are good. Um, all right, so this is, this is the DMCA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was, it came out in 1998, and it, as I said, prohibits um, prohibits circumventing those technological protections such as the DRM or digital rights management on something like DVDs. So yeah, as you can imagine, um, you, know, you can scan an OCR book, so that is legal, but it is expensive and it is time consuming. Um, it, the, it's a bigger problem for people working with um, audiovisual materials because there's not really an equivalent of like scanning and OCRing um, a DVD. Yeah. Um, so you want to keep going? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> so there, there's a process for the DMCA. It's, it's kind of an interesting law insofar as every three years there's a process where anyone can file a request for an exemption. Um, and then if you get an exemption, they have to be renewed um, every three years again. It's a straightforward process and opponents can't object unless something has materially changed. Um, so there's a bunch of exemptions that have been granted in the past. Um, you know, if, if your video game requires server communication and the company shuts down the server, um, you can crack your video game to be able to keep playing it, um, you know, computer programs on lawfully acquired devices for good faith security research, uh, being able to like use different materials with your 3D printer, um, and the Authors Alliance along with the Samuelson uh, Law, Technology, and Public Policy Clinic actually made the filing with support of, of ACH and other scholars. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? Next one? All right. um, 
So as a part of this, um, uh, there was a lot of negotiations about how to do this exemption. So the Samuelson Clinic, um, along with Authors Alliance, came to organizations like ACH and then individual scholars and labs um, across uh, people like David Bamman at Stanford um, and others to say, hey, tell us your use cases. Like exactly what can't you do? What kind of research is not possible because of these? And so a series of examples and cases and letters and ACH writing for the field of digital humanities in the U.S. sent a series of, uh, of, of um, issues that said, you know, I can't study, if you're a media scholar, you basically can't study the 20th century. You can't study the history of film very easily, period. So that was a part of that, um, getting these letters um, and trying to figure out exactly what that uh, exemption would look like. So. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, so w w this wasn't just a like you submit the letters and then you wait for an answer. There, there was an extensive back and forth process um, where uh, the copyright office would, would ask more questions, the rights holders would object to things, we had the chance to respond to their objections, um, and we had to make some compromises. So we didn't have letters from people outside large research focused universities, so we had to agree to limit the exemption to scholars with a university affiliation. So people in standalone libraries can't do it. There was a lot of resistance to letting scholars be able to look at these text with their eyeballs at all and like th this was the subject of a lot of negotiation uh, being able to say like no really like you have to be able to verify your results um, an appropriate security measure seemed like an utterly intractable issue where there was no security measure that was good enough for the rights holders um, and and so like there was just no progress on that whatsoever and so um no one thought that uh, they would file in favor of uh, the Authors Alliance and uh, the Samuelson Clinic and grant the exemption, but they did, uh, the co U.S. Copyright Office. So now in the U.S. as of last year uh, or so, right? Yeah, a year before. A year before. Yeah. It's time. Time. Oh, time is a, it's a uh, <laughs> Um, it, we now actually can, under a series of conditions, build a data set or build, um, break DRM on um, DVDs and eBooks in the U.S. and build large corpuses, a corpus for text and data mining in DH. Um, and so, uh, you, but there are a series of conditions that include um, having to be at an institution of higher education, having to make sure that um, the university has to purchase the materials, um, they have to come be bought in certain ways, and um, you also have um, to be stored in what's called like high, like um, a, a high level of privacy, which some interpret as being as the same level as medical data, which I find to be quite interesting because I study sitcoms and I really think Bewitch and I Dream a Genie are the same level as um, medical data, but you know, <laughs> we will do with that what you will. Um, so. Uh, so uh, we that's kind of the more pieces right now and that's the Piece. But the, the, the good news, though, is that um, by ruling in favor of this, the Copyright Office has functionally asserted that text and data mining is fair use. They wouldn't be granting this if it wasn't fair use, yeah. um, potentially. Um, so, yeah, things are complicated. Um, you know, people uh, working with video are in a good position. Yeah, you can rip DVDs, but the problem with the books is that you have to um, agree to license terms when you use an ebook store, and um, the, the Copyright Office cannot do contractual overrides. They can't say, this is legal, and so you can't tell people what they can and can't do um, that would inhibit their fair use rights. Um, so actually, um, the ebook people are not in a particularly much better place um, if they're buying their books from like any of your normal stores. Yeah, I mean, your, your Kindles, your Nooks, like all of your usual ebook stores um, now have a provision or, or did before that you can't crack the encryption and that is separate than, um, than the DMCA exemption. So. So now um, we're working on expanding this. Uh, as right now the exemption's back up, there's a series of uh, groups and projects that have some funding from the Mellon Foundation to be more test cases for why we need this exemption and we're looking to try to make it um, more capacious to include more groups, um, not, just in high, not just in institutions of higher ed and that. But it is a great, I think, I think we're in the last minute here, yep. so it's been a great development for us in terms of building data sets um, something that has been a bit, a bit easier in other uh, legal settings and it's opening up a whole new set of possibilities, which is to say that if you know of a project that is doing text and data mining that involves ebooks or DRM, we would love to know about it and help you also connect with the legal team because they are working on another round of exemptions to keep expanding it. Or if you're interested in this kind of work and pushing this, we would love to continue to talk to you. And if you have, um, and since we're in an international context, any examples of work as well would be greatly appreciative because we can use a kind of U.S. Uh, what's the rest of the world up to? Why? Wh wh where, what else is possible? Yeah. So, yeah.
And on that note, I think. Yep, that, that's what uh, we got. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Quinn and Lauren. It's such a victory for DH in the USA um, and a great example of that successful advocacy can work. Um, so next up, we're going to have Professor Konrad Desmet from University of Bergen talking about developments in Norway. Yeah, <clears throat> great. Um, uh, and congratulations to the scholars in the US for their victory. Um, now, I'm going to talk to you from a European perspective and, and more specifically from a Norwegian perspective. Um, let's see, how does this work? Uh, okay. My title, How Should We Share Research Data and Humanities, is taken from um, a report from the Research Council of Norway, uh, How Should We Share Research Data, a report that was made by a committee that included me and lots of other people. And we worked in the middle of the pandemic and we came up with uh, something I encourage you to read because it has, it has some repercussions outside of Norway and it could also maybe serve as a model for uh, similar reports uh, in other countries. Some general issues um, taken up by the report is that the term research data actually covers a broad range of data and there are notable differences between different disciplines when it comes to the kinds of data and how shareable they turn out to be. Uh, there are many laws and regulations at different levels, uh, in particular like at national level and at European level, that address rights, requirement, obligations and protection related, re relating to research data. Uh, so I'm actually not talking about you know, products like uh, DVDs or, or published book, but research data themselves. Um, <clears throat> in principle, they should facilitate and require the sharing of research data that originates from publicly funded research. Uh, there is, however, um, substantial expertise required to interpret the extensive and somewhat fragmentary regulatory framework and to arrive at good solutions when data is to be shared with others. Uh, also, uh, licenses uh, that are more close than necessary, and now I'm talking um, also about licenses that researchers themselves impose on their research data, on what they produce. Uh, such uh, closed licenses or semi-closed licenses tend to uh, harm reuse and are barriers to commercialization, if you think that commercialization is a good thing. But, you know, we can discuss that. Um, the, another thing is attribution stacking, not to uh, be confused with sandwich stacking, which I saw out there in the, in the hall. Um, attribution stacking can occur when people combine many data sets from different sources or reuse research data based on many sources and attribution conditions are by law often stricter than the recognized ethical standards for good reference practice. So in, in, you know, in, in practice uh, you can combine data from thousands of sources and uh, with um, inappropriate licenses you're required to attribute uh, all, the, all those sources which is in practice not, not doable. There are many other factors also, aside from the legal framework that influence researchers' opportunities and willingness to share data, like available infrastructure, resources, motivation, and skills and competence. And the current academic incentive system in most countries does not substantially reward the sharing of research data. Now, getting to some humanity-specific issues, in disciplines that study human expressions of the mind and emotions, like language, literature, music, dance, theater, etc., the research data are often based on copyrighted material, and that was also taken up in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, language corpora, for example, are scientific annotations of text or speech, and each piece of input can be independent intellectual property protected by copyright. Or a musicological database will often contain sheet music as well as audio and video recorders at different performances. And each performance can have several originators like composer, lyricist, performer, producer, choreographer, etc. And therefore, uh, different organizations can manage their moral and economic rights. Um, very often, we also see dual use. Even, even um, perf performing scholars may, um, may do put up performances that both have, uh, um, a, uh, let us say, a performance value and, and an academic research value. Overlapping rights make it more complicated to clarify the copyright issue before the material is published. 
Uh, in addition, you also have, of course, the other issue, which is personal information. Uh, for example, in corpora, that's difficult or impossible to avoid, like corpora of spontaneous speech, school essays of, or sign language uh, are practically impossible to, to make uh, available to um, uh, the wider community of scholars. Uh, and in some cases you can do with pseudon pseudonymization, but that is often challenging or sometimes impossible. Uh, a little bit about the EU Di Digital Single Market Directive. My colleague uh, Pavel will say more about that later. Uh, here I quote from the directive. The legal uncertainty concerning text and data mining should be addressed by providing for a mandatory exception for universities and other research organizations, as well as for cultural heritage institutions, to the exclusive right of reproduction and to the right to prevent extraction from a database. So here we have text and data mining, which, which, which was also men, men, mentioned by the previous speakers. Um, uh, that was always sort of um, put forward as a very desirable exemption. Um, and the problem is then that even though this is a, a European directive, the different European countries have implemented that in different ways. Uh, and a little bit like was the case in the, in the United States, in Norway, all institutions, with the exception of the National Library, must apply explicitly to the Ministry for permission to obtain workable digital copies of copyrighted data, which is a time-consuming process. Um, the report came with some recommendations, like the government must ensure that strategies, regulation guidelines that deal with or regulate the sharing and research, re reuse of data are aligned across ministries, because actually it's not just the Ministry of Research and Education, it's also the Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Economic Affairs that all have their interests in, in, in research data. Um, and um, one should, of course, ha have uh, one should operate data infrastructure that allow research data to be made available in accordance with the fair principles. Uh, uh, the government should give institutions the resources they need to be able to raise the level of expertise on open science and provide necessary support services to researchers. And of course, we should try to remove the legal requirement that institutions apply for permission to the ministry to copy source data. Uh, funders are uh, recommended to um, to uh, make uh, sure that open science practices, including make it, making uh, data sets, um, uh, are available in, in accordance with the FAIR principles and good licensing agreements. Uh, they should confer merit uh, and be included in the overall assessment of projects in connection with uh, funding allocation in line with the Declaration on Research Assessment. Funders should also be clear about when the results of publicly funded research projects are to be shared, and it should be a rule that they're uh, should be made available as soon as possible. Uh, finally, research institutions should develop long-term strategies for sharing and management of data. Open science in general and data management in particular, including licensing and citation, should be included in all bachelor's and master's degree programs. Uh, and also, of course, ethics and integrity in research, which is related to this. Uh, institutions should highlight the cost associated with making data fair in project applications. And they should motivate researchers by conferring merit for the publication of reusable data sets and other research results and best practice in open science. Finally, uh, last slide, um, the report draws up some license etiquette rules. Uh, the first uh, point is actually is just a definition. A license or dedication to public domain should contain terms and conditions that reflect the permitted further use of the research data. Research data should have international standard licenses. By the way, there was, a, there was once a, uh, an effort to make uh, country-specific licenses, so Norway had their own licenses, and of course that didn't work at all. Um, international standard licenses should be used that have as few restrictions, restrictions on access and purpose as possible, should promote the principles of legal interoperability of research data, and uh, the licenses should be both human readable and machine readable in line with uh, the, the FAIR uh, requirements. Uh, metadata should always be dedicated to the public domain, typically an, a fully open license, a CC0. So in other words, everybody should be able to access metadata at all times. Uh, standard licenses intended for intellectual property should only be used for data that meet the copyright or database protection requirement. In cases where different legal terms and conditions apply to different parts of the data set, 
differentiated licenses should be used in order to avoid imposing a too restrictive license on all of the data just because some of the data requires it. And institutions should have a responsibility for ensuring that a license or dedication to public domain is issued for all research data produced by their employees. So uh, do uh, read the report. You can find the report by just Googling share research data on the site rcn.no, which is the Research Council of Norway. Thank you. Thank you so much, Conrad. Uh, once again, we see researchers in communication with government and lawmaking bodies, and we're seeing that successes can be made. So this is another fantastic report. Thank you so much. So next up, we're going to have Pavel Komotsky from the Institut für Deutsche Sprache in Mannheim, Germany, showing that even after laws are made and enacted, there's still a lot left to interpret and to understand about them. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, what I want to tell you about today is the Directive on uh, Copyright in the Digital Single Market, the so-called DSM Directive for short, um, and its impact on digital humanities. So, first of all, what is uh, the DSM Directive? Well, it's a EU directive. Um, of uh, 17th of April 2019, and it is the most important, the most comprehensive copyright piece of copyright legislation in the European Union since 2001. Uh, so uh, it it really is um, a, a very substantial uh, change to the legal uh, framework uh, concerning copyright law in Europe. Uh, and one of its announced purposes is uh, to address new uses in fields of research, innovation, education and preservation of cultural heritage enabled by digital uh, technologies. This is what is expressly said in one of the recitals of the directive. Um, um, just for your information, uh, the directive has 34 pages. Um, uh, and 32 articles, um, which is actually very long for a copyright directive. Uh, it's much shorter than the GDPR, for example, but the previous um, uh, copyright directive that had such a large scope, the, the, the directive uh, from 2001 um, on copyright and information society had 10 pages. So uh, you can imagine the inflation of uh, legal norms, um, really. Um, right, and uh, since it's a directive, it needs to be transposed uh, into national laws in order to apply. As you know, directives, it's kind of a tricky name for a layperson, but directives don't apply directly uh, in, uh, in, in national laws, but in order to become applicable in national laws of EU member states, they have to be transposed. That is, the national laws of the member state have to be modified in such a way as to be made compatible with uh, the directive. And the deadline for implementation uh, of this particular directive uh, was June 7, 2021. Most countries did not implement in time, which is kind of standard, uh, but this time uh, there was a good excuse, the pandemic, between 2019 and 2021, uh, so national legislators had uh, other fish to fry uh, than copyright uh, during, uh, during that period. Uh, as far as I know, most countries have already uh, implemented uh, the DSM directive, but it happened uh, in some cases quite significantly after the deadline. Um, all right, so uh, the, most, the single most important uh, provision in this directive for digital humanities is the exception for text and data mining purposes for scientific research. Now, what it says, let me break it into uh, bullet points for you. So, first of all, who is the beneficiary? Who can do text and data mining for scientific purposes within the meaning of this exception? research organizations and cultural heritage institutions. Research organizations are broadly defined as universities and research institutes with an exclusion of research institutes 
um, uh, that generate knowledge to which uh, private undertaking has preferential access. What it means is um, you have a company like, uh, let me take uh, BMW as an example, and BMW would have a research institute, uh, BMW Research presumably. And so this BMW Research um, uh, or Google Research or Google Lab uh, is not covered by this directive because it's a research institution that uh, actually um, produces knowledge to which uh, a company, their mother company, uh, have preferential access. But uh, universities in the traditional European sense and let me call them public research uh, institutes are research organizations within the meaning of the directive. And cultural heritage institutions, here the definition is much simpler. By enumeration, uh, cultural heritage institutions are libraries, museums, and archives. Uh, right. Um, um, so what uh, these beneficiaries can do is they can make copies of content that is lawfully accessible, that they have lawful access to, uh, that is either these institutions have a license to use the content or, and that's very important, the content is available on the open internet. So um, it's kind of the right to read is the right to mine. If you have lawful access to the work, you can make copies of the work for the purposes of text and data mining for scientific research. Uh, it's also important to note that text and data mining is defined in very broad terms uh, and it covers all sorts of automated analysis of digital data. So if you think, oh, it's a pity it doesn't cover my field because I do machine translation and uh, this exception is about text and data mining and not machine translation. Machine translation is covered, it's a form of text and data mining within the meaning of this directive. Um, there is also a permission to retain the copies, that is, you build a corpus for text and data mining, you can retain uh, the copies uh, for later research, for future research, or uh, for verification of results, but these copies have to be stored with an appropriate level of security. Um, right holders, that is owners of databases uh, typically, can only implement technological protection measures to protect security and integrity of their databases, so they cannot prevent text and data mining through technical means altogether, they can also only limit it uh, to a reasonable extent so that uh, the database uh, is, the, the functioning of the database is not endangered. Um, and probably uh, well, one of the most important factors is that this exception overrides contracts. So if you have a license to use uh, an ebook, for example, and the license says you cannot TDM it, you cannot use it for text and data mining purposes, kaboom, you can, because the law says you can, uh, and the exception overrides contracts. It also brings some new challenges. For example, uh, the question that arises is, can I share those copies, can I share my corpus with other researchers? Well, we don't know. It very much depends on the national uh, implementation. In Germany, specifically, yes, but elsewhere. Uh, we don't know, it remains to be seen. Um, uh, and perhaps even more importantly, can I publish and share the outcome of the TDM, for example, in language model, the, the result of my TDM, uh, um, of my text and data mining uh, procedure? Well, we don't know. Is it a derivative work in the sense of copyright? That which means that the right holders of the original data actually hold some sort of right over the model as well. We don't know that and maybe we will learn more about it from a lawsuit that is currently going, in, going on in uh, the UK that, has, that is no longer in the European Union but has a similar text and data mining exception uh, and it's Getty Images Against Stability. I'll not bore you with the details but uh, Getty Images is a database of uh, images and this database was used for AI training, and so the AI, um, AI uh, uh, tool was then generating images like this with the Getty, something that looks like the Getty Images watermark, right? And so Getty Images was very unhappy about it and they sued, 
uh, for unlawful use of the uh, database. And maybe we'll know more. Uh, maybe the lawsuit will actually uh, bring some answers to our questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, right. There are also other provisions that are r r related to uh, digital humanities, uh, but I'll just uh, mention them very briefly, and if you have questions, I can answer during the uh, Q&A session. So Article 8 is about the use of out-of-commerce works by cultural heritage institutions, which means that libraries and archives can share out-of-commerce works, that is, works that can, books that can no longer be bought on the market, they are not available on the market, which is a lion's share of books in libraries, I imagine. Um, so uh, libraries can scan and make uh, those books available for non-commercial purposes, like research, um, but only if they obtain a license from a representative collective management organization, which is a bummer. Um, um, Article 12 is about collective licensing with an extended effect, and those of you who hail from Scandinavia will be very familiar with this framework. It actually allows you to um, get an extended license, that is, get a license from a collective management organization, for example, to use all literary work. You only need one license, and it's valid for all the literary works for research purposes, which simplifies the licensing process considerably. And there is also, uh, for those of you who do visual art, uh, there is a provision on works of visual art in the public domain, which actually prohibits uh, exclusive rights in scans or simple photos of these works so that they don't re-enter, uh, so they don't uh, leave the public domain magically just by being photographed or scanned, right? Uh, interesting stuff. Uh, if you have questions, I'll be there for you for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Pavel. These laws take years to write, years to get enacted, and then there's still so much to interpret and to understand, and you've been a major voice in interpreting these in the EU. So next up, we have Kim Nayer from Cornell Law School Library. Thank you. Um, so I am going to give a brief overview of some recent U.S. and Canada copyright um, developments that I think have some implications for DH. I have four things here, and the, the, the last two that are, for some reason, in a different font. Um, I think it's actually good. It's highlighting to me that I may not get to those two things, depending on how the rest goes. Um, so first, the U.S., and I just want to just uh, recap um, fair use and what it, what it means for those of you who are not familiar with the US law and fair use. So it is a statutory limitation um, on ex exclusive rights. So it's, it's, a, it's a enacted provision that allows people who are not the copyright holder to do certain things with copyright protected work. Um, and there's a, generally speaking a four factor test that's used. Um, that relate to either the use or the work itself. So the courts will consider um, uh, purpose and character of the use. Mainly this has become about whether the use is transformative, whether there's something new, and that's really a lot of what DH work is doing, is it's transforming the original work into something else um, for a different purpose. And also uh, the nature of the work itself, um, the amount and the substantiality of the portion that's used. So again, that's another issue that tends to uh, weigh against a lot of work that's in DH because we would use large quantities, if not the whole of the work. And then another factor is the effect on the market for the original work. And so that means, is your work, is your use of the work um, going to have an impact on the publisher's uh, market, for example? So that's just a um, little background, and I wanted to just let you know of the most recent um, case that talked about fair use. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of this Andy Warhol Foundation case um, versus Lynn Goldsmith. And so Goldsmith, back in the 80s, was a, a photographer. She photographed um, artists, mu musicians, and she had taken a photograph of the musician Prince um, for a magazine um, profile when he was fairly up and coming and, and not really, really well known. Um, and she had, uh, so she'd licensed this um, 
photograph to uh, Vanity Fair. She she had uh, received some compensation for it. Vanity Fair, I think it was the magazine, also wanted to um, pay for, wanted to use her photo, uh, they said, as an artist's reference for another artist who wanted to do uh, create a visual art piece related to that. They didn't actually tell her it was Andy Warhol. And so she did, and I think she got $800 for that licensed additional use. Um, long drawn out proceedings, she didn't actually become aware of that use of, by Andy Warhol until Prince's death in 2016, when she saw this stylized version of her photograph on a different um, magazine cover. Um, so that's when she began a lawsuit. There were all kinds of limitations issues that prevented her from suing the magazine. So ultimately it became a case about fair use and whether the Warhol Foundation's use of her photograph years later was a fair one. Um, and th so this was a case that had really unsympathetic facts for the person who was doing the copying. And uh, it, it was a split decision, but the, what was really good and really I think useful is that the majority really constrained its reasons to the facts of the case, and they did not really push away from transformative. I think a lot of people were assuming that this case, because of its bad facts, were, uh, would sort of lead away from transformativeness, and also at the court during the arguments was really interested in the fact that there was a commercial purpose to the use. Um, and so, uh, but you know, the Warhol, they only appealed on the purpose and character, the, the um, first transformative use factor, not the other factors. So um, that's all that the court can, could, could consider in this case. So uh, I don't think it has any impact on the transformative use, even though in that case it wasn't considered sufficiently transformative and Goldsmith won. So prior to that, the you might have heard in April 2021, there was a different Supreme Court case on fair dealing and this um, one is again potentially applicable to DH scholars. That was a case where uh, Google um, had copied what the court called or what they, the parties called declaring code of um, Oracle's API and used it in building. This is a long drawn out case about um, smartphones and the Samsung or the, the um, Android uh, operating system. And in that case, the court actually found that copying this declarative declaring code uh, was a transformative use, even though it was just straight copying code, um, because it, it did expand the use of smartphones and the usefulness of smartphones. So in this case, it's also really important to note that although the court said it was going to consider um, whether copyright subsists, it actually did a little bit of an end round and said, let's assume it does. Um, and so they assumed copyright subsists in an API, and then they said, okay, assuming it does, it's a fair use. So um, basically the, the use could be done whether there was uh, either on the basis that there was no copyright or that it was a fair use. And so the court just decided to um, talk about fair use. But it was interesting in that the majority in this case mentioned that those four factors that we hear about so much, they said that they're not exhaustive or exclusive or equal to each other necessarily. And so we don't hear that that often, that those fair four factors are not exhaustive of all possibilities of fair use. So I think that's another really important case to be aware of. Um, and I just want to talk briefly about a more recent one, um, a very recent case. You might know about the Hachette book, Hachette and Internet Archives, an Internet Archive digitizing print books. Um, circulating them through their, what they call an open library. That ca case, you know, everyone's been watching it and uh, it, they lost flat out and uh, the, Hachette, the publisher, the, the four publishers got summary judgment against the Internet Archive in that case. And, um, the, you know, the court didn't really get into this, the issues about um, the uh, different arguments that, the Internet Archive was making about its transformative use in digitizing these books and that the libraries were interested in um, advocating as well. But it, it simply was just not a favorable set of facts, again, for the court. Um, the court said that this 
di digitization by Internet Archive was not transformative because the, the case actually focused on a, a select number of the books that, that Internet Archive digitized, and those were also available for purchase as ebooks. So that, you know, in reference to the impact on the market, um, that's where the court said that this is not a fair use. It was an infringing reproduction. And that, that's an important point, too, is that digitization to, to um, do this kind of lending, um, the court said that digitization is an infringing reproduction versus a necessary immediate step, which is the approach taken in, I think, the EU and in, in um, Canada as well. So, um, it, you know, again, it, uh, not, not a great set of facts. In the library world, we don't think that this will affect other initiatives, but we, we have to see, and Internet Archive says they will appeal. So I just have a few minutes left, and I have to get into Canada still. I'm going to skip this slide for now. Um, now I just want to talk about fair dealing in Canada. So it's, uh, it's become a lot broader than the text of the legislation would leave you to think. So back in 2004, a really important decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, it was actually about a library uh, scanning and uh, law library scanning and lending um, cases, including the, re the copyright content of the, you know, the summaries that the publishers had included along with the um, open access judgment itself. So the court has said since 2004 repeatedly that fair dealing can have several threshold allowable purposes. Even though you see these, these very strict uh, lang uh, phrasings in the act, they give a very broad interpretation. So research and private study is not just taking um, a copy and then studying at home. It can be um, producing copies for your students in the class. That's considered research and private copying for research and private study. So they, they've sort of opened the threshold a little bit um, more broadly than you might think by reading the statute. And then after you get through that threshold, there's a fairness analysis which is also very broad that essentially is meant to balance the interests of the copyright holder with what the court repeatedly characterizes as user rights. And they hold those two things in balance. So the court is very, has been very careful to not privilege the rights of copyright holders over the rights of users to do things that are allowable. And when they're talking about the user's rights, they're talking about the ultimate user. So it may be, you know, for example, a library digitizing a book and the ultimate user might be the uh, researcher or even the student working on the project. Um, so it's, it's a, it's an interesting and expansive definition. Um, this is a, the next two slides are both examples of, uh, to Eric's earlier point, advocacy. I was involved in um, uh, amicus, the equivalent of amicus briefs and argument at the Supreme Court of Canada in both of these, unfortunately, during the virtual hearing days, so I didn't get to go to the court in my robes. Um, but both of these cases are really favorable to users in terms of users' rights. So York University is a case about copying for, for co um, course packs. And in that case, on the facts, the court didn't really need to determine fair dealing, but it was a very helpful case because they corrected, and they don't always do this, but they corrected the approach of the court below, which did not focus strongly enough on the rights of the user and the ultimate user being the um, student in that, in that um, context who was receiving the copies of readings for, case, uh, for their um, classes. And again, they took the opportunity to emphasize that fair dealing has to balance the just rewards to the creator with, uh, like they're phrasing, the robust public sphere of created, creative works. So um, the, the next case wasn't really about fair use or fair dealing, um, but it was about a making available right the libraries, this was the Canadian Association of Law Libraries and Library Futures Institute, we intervened because it was um, going to potentially implicate um, things that we do online. Um, so it was about whether, um, you know, there was a, the, the, I won't go into the details of the making available li right, but it was about whether there's double compensation involved. But the important part of this case for us is that court took pains throughout to reaffirm the principle of technological neutrality in interpreting copyright law. So, so far as possible, we interpret copyright law consistently 
whether the activity being done is analog or digital. And so again, that's, that can be a really helpful um, interpretation for libraries as well as for digital humanists. Um, so th yeah, again, this is just some, some phrasing there. And again, re-emphasizing the balance of users' rights and authors' rights. So I think I might be short of time. Yeah. All right. So um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I've got. I told you I wouldn't get to these, and I didn't. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim. For those of you in common law jurisdictions like the USA, Canada, Australia, India, these big cases can really change the law affecting everything. So Kim, thank you so much for talking about some of these big cases. I'm sorry we didn't have time for everything, but hopefully in the Q&A uh, we can get to more. So next up we have Benito Trollop from the South African Center for Digital Language Resources. And Benito's um, contribution will be remote. Good afternoon. My name is Benito Trollope. I am a digital humanities researcher at the South African Center for Digital Language Resources. And uh, I'm really grateful to be part of this panel. Just allow me to quickly share my screen and then we can get started. So the title of my contribution today is uh, the possibilities of safeguarding online data sets containing personal information, a South African perspective. So the structure for today, I will first give some broad context of South Africa, of digital humanities in South Africa, and of personal data uh, protection in South Africa. And then um, more specifically, I will go into measures impacting digital humanities research, and then more uh, into privacy and data protection in the light of OPIA, or the Protection of Personal Information Act. And I will give examples of data sets in our resource repository that made us um, you know, think of the personal information implications of some of the data we, we, uh, we host. And then I'm going to specify some current safeguarding measures and I will conclude. So first of all, very broadly, South Africa is a constitutional democracy um, and we are a developing country and um, our legal system is based on Roman Dutch law. And then secondly, uh, digital humanities as a research field in South and Southern Africa is pretty much still emerging, it's very new, but it's part of our mandate at the South African Center for Digital Language Resources to foster a community um, that practices digital humanities research. And then, um, Going more specific, uh, in terms of privacy measures uh, that impact research in South Africa, um, the legislation we have came into effect only on the 1st of July, 2021. So even though people knew about it beforehand, it only became um, of effect uh, quite recently. And then uh, just a note that the sources that will be mentioned later in this talk uh, are taken from our own language resource repository that is open access to everybody, even uh, outside of South Africa. So measures impacting digital humanities research in South Africa at the moment is first of all, data literacy uh, in general, and then promoting the fair and care principles of, of uh, sharing data or making data available. And um, maybe uh, in the light of um, this being a legal panel, the care principles uh, are um, more relevant as it uh, pertains specifically to ethics uh, more broadly. But then other measures impacting research uh, already mentioned, for example, is the POPIA um, legislation we have that is uh, basically equivalent of the GDPR uh, in the European Union. And there has been engagement specifically applying POPIA to the research environment and not only to other uh, spheres of, of, the, um, of the economy. Um, that is evident from the research protocol developed by Adams et al. I think it's about 23 different authors, uh, all involved in some kind of research uh, in South Africa, and then the discussion in Davega. 
And then also impacting DH research ultimately is the very recent protection, promotion, development and management of Indigenous Knowledge Act. Uh, 6 of 2019. Um, so this is especially relevant um, for uh, indigenous communities or research um, that um, aims at either preserving that knowledge or um, yeah, any type of uh, use of indigenous knowledge. And then uh, ultimately also copyright legislation in the sense of uh, people doing text-based work or uh, work on any type of copyrighted material. So the act is quite established, uh, but the amendment bill is quite interesting uh, in the sense that it is still in the process uh, of uh, taking uh, academic opinions and other submissions on um, how to improve it. Uh, for example, the amendment bill um, adds a fair use clause to um, copyrighted material. And I think that is still going to um, ruffle a few feathers, but that is for the future. In this talk, I'm just focusing on um, OPIA or more specifically privacy matters in data sets. So the two um, examples I have on the slides now are data sets in our resource repository. So the first one is the Afrikaans speaking children's first lexical items. So the description is taken from the description on the site. So mention is made of children and uh, the fact that notes were taken by the mothers uh, on their first lexical item. So uh, first of all, the mention of children immediately uh, lets, um, yeah, there's red flags of uh, very uh, vulnerable people in society. So first of all, we had to make sure that does the researcher who did the research, um, did she receive ethical clearance? And she did. And when you um, go and find this item on the repo, you will see it's an Excel uh, sheet. So she did what she could in terms of um, making the data as unidentifiable as possible, but as identifiable as needed for a study. And then another example, we can go into more detail uh, later. I'm just um, under time. So uh, the South African Multilingual Learner Corpus of Academic Texts. Um, yeah, from the description, it doesn't sound too invasive or um, in contradiction of um, protecting personal data. But when this uh, corpus was submitted, it was, um, yeah, information in there included student numbers, uh, it included emails, so obviously uh, personal uh, information. So especially this last source made us um, at Sarila uh, think about measures we implement in terms of protecting data. So even though the study or the project under which the corpus was developed did have ethical clearance, our job as a a institute that hosts this data is also to do our very best in protecting the data um, subjects um, in, in the study. So um, we went and looked at our safeguarding measures and just to contextualize further in Adams et al, uh, they table numerous ways of safeguarding data that includes something like a privacy policy and restricting access. So um, currently on the, on the repo, we have an institutional login for people who wish to make submissions in the form of data sets or corpora or speech data. And um, there's the option to only add metadata and not add downloadable files. So that is also um, the discretion of the uh, person or uh, institute uploading the data. And then we are exploring options of um, giving people the opportunity to note if anonymization is possible, they can possibly upload the files. So that is um, just what we had to think about or yeah, take stock of. And Sarila did a privacy statement that is available on the website, um, committing ourselves to the best intent to serve the research community in hosting these, um, these data sets um, and doing our best to make it as safe um, in terms of protecting um, sensitive information as we can. And we offer recourse to users 
to contact us if they find a data set or an item in the repository that they feel um, can be uh, regarded as um, contravening what we what we say and we do want to keep the document uh, dynamic so as we get feedback we will also um, renew our, our privacy statement so just to conclude OPIA has already had an impact on the management and curation of data in South Africa. Uh, there's an imperative uh, broadly to not only become data literate, but also to have knowledge of relevant legislation and collaborating across borders will be influenced. I think it is already being influenced, uh, as can be seen by Gastro and Adams, uh, comparing South African and European um, data protection mechanisms. And then there should be continuous effort to make sure that the protection of data does not uh, necessarily or unjustly impede uh, research. I want to thank everybody. There's the references uh, to the legislation as well. The presentation is available online and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Benito. I believe he'll be able to join us uh, via chat in the Q&A. Um, as an individual researcher, you should probably only worry about the laws of the country you're in, but as we're seeing, the laws of the world quietly influence one another, as we've heard from Benito and many other speakers. So next up, we have Kianori Nag Kianori Nagasaki of the International Institute for Digital Humanities in Tokyo. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, present the, the title, uh, In Recent Situation of Legal Issues for DH in Japan. So I'm not a legal expert, but just a user of the law as a DH researcher. I have worked with lawyers to provide input to the government's call for public comment on the copyright law. and. I, will, I have experience in resolving issues with, with lawyers regarding the handling of material whose copyright has expired. So agenda. So I will I will um, talk about these um, matters. So there are may, many legal issues for DH in Japan. Then I will focus the following matters according to my concerns. So solutions and issues on copyright law for DH in Japan, licensing issues of public domain resources in Japan, and some issues of generative AI in Japan. So a uh, revision of the copyright law in Japan in, nine, in 2019, the law has become stricter at that time. Before, um, an offense cannot be prosecuted without the compliant by the victim. But uh, after the uh, re revision, an offense can be perfected without uh, compliant by the victim. Similar with other advanced countries, it was a drastic change in Japan so that publishers have become to accuse pirates without uh, compliant by the author or creator. But uh, become flexible in other aspect instead of the strict conditions. So copyrighted contents have become freely available for analysis of copyrighted contents. Search of them with only a small search result, like non-consumptive use in Hattitrust and Google Books, under several conditions. So it's it, the revision was conducted in order to promote industry. The legal change aims to facilitate development of AI technology, giving copyrighted contents to deep learning development, increase of opportunities to be bought, building web search site for copyrighted contents, and more. It also promotes academic activities treating copyrighted contents. So, as you know, how did it digital library as a precedent? As you know, non-consumptive use as a key concept. It shows only search results, neither the text nor snippet. It's stricter than Google Books. 
data capsule environment by Hati Trust Research Center. You can see on the website the H HTRC data capsule environment provides individual secure computing environment to analyze content in the Hati Trust digital library. Researchers can analyze Hati Trust data text data, only performing computational analysis within the secure data capsule environment, and then export the result of their analysis to meet the HDRC, the policy for non-consumptive data export. Then, before the legal change in Japan, anyone can officially do OCR only for public domains. So if someone did OCR for copyright books, the result could not be shared widely. It was limited to personal use. Others could only share the result of the analysis of the OCR. Such kind of research result couldn't be validated by other researchers. It was a serious issue for academic activities from a recent viewpoint of research ethics. So, the Agency of Cultural Affairs of Japan categorized activities of usage of copyrighted contents into three layers. Layer one, and not how the interest of copyright holders like copy to facilitate processing the works on computer network. On layer two, harm the interest of copyright holders as little as possible like Google Books. So, Layer 3, uh, use of copyrighted material to realize public interest policy. Then, layer 1 and 2 were treated in this legal change. Then, I'd like to uh, introduce two articles in the uh, revised law a little. The following two articles are key for the activities. Article 30. 4 and 47.5. So Article 30 and 4 allows to analyze copyrighted works without exploitation for enjoying or causing another person to enjoy the ideas or emotions expressed in such work. And so then another article it allows minor exploitation associated with providing results of computer processing to produce new knowledge or information. And uh, so, so details are uh, put on there. Then, and the conditions. Uh, Mr. Ryuichi Minami in the National Diet Library summarized the conditions below. So, so, so <laughs> I don't have a time to read all, all the conditions, but like this. Then the conditions and his commentary are available on the e-newsletter, Digital Humanities Monthly in Japanese, and it's uh, on its website. So then a current use case, the National Data Library has released full text search for its digitized collection, including copyright-protected copyright books. So, around 80% of um, 3 million books. So, it shows snippet as the research user, uh, sorry, search result, and the full text have been authored by the AIS assisted software, which was developed by the library, and the software is open license. Then, and then, next, I would like to uh, go to the licensing issues of public domain resources. There are many digitized public domain cultural resources on web also in Japan, including digitized text and images. There is no legal protection for editing classics or classical resources in Japan. So there are several attitudes for providing the public domain resources. So we list them without any condition, with asking to show attribution of the owner or the provider. 
and the owner to give the deliver deliverable to the owner or the provider. Some institutions require either or both. And uh, pro prohibition for some kinds of usages, non-commercial, non-redistribution, non-publication, non-citation. And um, uh, two and four don't have legally binding, but maybe a global issue. So, especially for digitized images, according to the recent trends to adopt AAAF, licensing issues of digital images are focused by digital or just human researchers. So, manuscripts, uh, woodcut printing, paintings, and so on. So, for example, in 20, 2019, I got um, pub public domain images from British Museum, then the museum gave me a terms of terms and conditions uh, with the high resolution images, which was painted by uh, a, a painter who already uh, lost the uh, co copyright. So, also, you, you know, uh, in, in the Gallica or the National Library of France also um, give a similar condition, so similar conditions so far. So, however, um, motivation to ask or require to show attributions and to give the deliverables. So, owners and providers need evaluation of their providing activity. Uh, sorry, activities to get budget to keep them open web because university and cultural institutions are always under pressure to reduce their budget. So listing user use cases of them are useful for the purpose. The condition makes easy to catch and to show the use cases for the institutions. So rights statement may be useful but not, not so popular so far. Then, so I, I, have a, I have more time? No? You're now over time. Ah, so uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. So then I, I, I will skip. <laughs> and uh, so we, we have some issues of generative AI for DH. So, so there is a copyright issues in the development and training phase of AI and in products generated by generative AI. Then, so I, I made uh, some slide, but uh, it's, it's, it's just, uh, um, as, just as summarized uh, by the Japanese governmental uh, cultural affairs. So then, and then, so we are treating um, it also as an ethical issue, but so, while many humanities researchers have a sense of ur urgency uh, about generative AI, more or less, but so they do not have the power to reflect this in the governmental policy so far. Okay, sorry, thank you. Thank you so much, Kianori, um, for that update from Japan. And it's fascinating to see the transmission of this non-consumptive use doctrine kind of percolating around the world, that doctrine has actually come from communities, including the DH community. It didn't come from courts or legislatures or anything. So, <laughs> so I'm Eric Ketson. I'll give the final talk, and then we'll have the Q&A. Um, so today I'm going to talk about this brand new AI Act in the EU that's happened way faster than anyone expected, including myself. So I'm going to talk about this new AI Act and its potential impact on DH, some initial observations. So what is this new AI Act? It's going to create a new EU regulation, and it's going to amend existing laws in the EU. As Pavel mentioned, um, a directive takes a few years for the, national members, uh, the member states to implement, but not a regulation. A regulation comes into effect immediately, and that's what's going to happen here. Um, 
Just a few weeks ago, the European Parliament finalized its amendments to the AI Act. It's now moving to something called the Trilogue, where three European lawmaking bodies are going to have a little meeting and figure out the final steps. But the AI Act is expected to come into force by end of this year. So this is all moving very quickly. You might think the AI Act is just about AI, but it's not. The definition of AI is very broad in here. In Annex 1, here's the official definition. It covers machine learning approaches, including supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Log this vague language of logic and knowledge-based approaches, statistical approaches, Bayesian estimation, search and optimization methods. This is so much more broad than what you might think of as AI. I mean, even a linear regression is almost falling into this definition. So, the purpose of the AI Act is to take a broad view of what constitutes an AI system, but a very narrow view on the use cases. This is the approach that the EU legislator has taken because code will change, methods will change, definitions of AI will change, but the use cases won't. So actually, I personally think this is quite a smart approach. The AI Act separates AI systems, AI, I should probably put them in quotation marks, into three buckets. There are unacceptable risks, risk where certain use cases are absolutely prohibited, and I'll get to those in a second. And then AI systems are cat categorized as either high risk or low or no risk. If it's a high risk AI system, there are certain regulatory requirements then. They have to perform either a self-assessment or get an assessment of risk from a third party, and they may have to register their system with an EU authority. So this is, this is gonna be the new system in the EU. Starting with those unacceptable risks, Article 5 lays out completely prohibitive use cases by AI systems. Now, these won't, really, this, these won't affect DH researchers. These new prohibitive use, prohibited use cases include deploying uh, AI systems that deploy subliminal techniques to distort a person's behavior, or AI systems that exploit the vulnerabilities of a specific group of people due to their age, physical, or mental disability. Social scoring al algorithms will be totally banned um, by public authorities um, that may want to score people on their health or their credit rating or um, different sen sensitive aspects. Such social scoring algorithms by public authorities will be completely banned under the AI Act, as will real-time remote biometric information systems by law enforcement, although there are certain exceptions. So for the DH researcher, you know, you don't have to really think about this too much, except that the kinds of companies that did this or maybe operating on the borders of such activities may be hiring DH graduates. So these are the kinds of jobs that your students might be looking at. So it's something for us to generally be aware of as a community. Now, let's get into the high-risk systems. Um, Annex 3 of the AI Act defines eight high-risk systems. I don't have time to get into all of them, but the two I would mention for DH is biometric identification and categorization of natural persons. There's some DH research that operates almost on the edges of this, where it, you take a large data set, you take a bunch of social media, and you're putting natural persons into buckets of something. So this is some, something to be aware of. In terms of DH education, there are high-risk systems involved with education. So if you use a sophisticated computer program with academic admissions or with academic assessment, that could easily be considered a high-risk system and then might have to either perform a self-assessment, an external assessment, or register with the EU government. So if your DH program has 100 applications and you're like, I'm good with Python, I'm going to write a statistical program to help me with my admissions and my marking, yeah, maybe don't. 
The good news generally for DH research is there is a general research exception in the AI Act, um, which states in the draft, this isn't totally finalized, this regulation should help in supporting research and innovation and should not undermine research and development activity and respect freedom of scientific research. It is therefore necessary to exclude from its scope AI systems specifically developed for the sole purpose of scientific research. So scientific research is generally, pure scientific research will generally not be affected by the AI Act. However, some DH research is intended to eventually be commercialized. So then it's something to consider. I have four minutes, which is perfect, because these are my real takeaways from today. First of all, the draft text presented today must still be finalized by the trilogue before becoming EU law. The AI Act covers much more than AI. Many types of code for text and data mining fall under the scope. As we've seen with the laws of the world quietly influencing each other, the EU AI Act is the first major regulation of AI computer systems on this scale globally. And all jurisdictions considering AI regulations in the future will have to be aware of it as a model or as a comparison. In education, we should avoid using complex computer systems in admissions or assessment of students. In DH research, even with a general research exception, researchers should be mindful of maybe especially the biometric identification and categorization of natural persons. Many of the industries which may be doing consider considering or operating on the borders of prohibitive, prohibited acts or high risk systems are those that potentially hire DH graduates. You know, the companies that operate along these borders look for some computer skills like our students. In the EU, much of the AI Act could be interpreted to be simply repeating or maybe reinforcing on standards already set by the GDPR. So how much of this will change is open, I guess we have to see, because some of this stuff was already covered by GDPR to an extent. Regardless, the AI Act is gonna usher in a whole new ecosystem in the EU, just like GDPR did of compliance, consultants, lawyers, policies, best practices, codes of conduct, university policies, library policies, just like that ecosystem developed after the GDPR, it's inevitable, it seems, that it's gonna develop after the AI Act. So thank you very much, that's all I have. Um, and we're gonna move to, I'll invite the speakers back up and we're gonna move to our Q, general Q&A, thank you. So, yeah, speakers, please come up. Um, and thank you all for your contributions. We're first going to open the floor to questions from the audience. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have a, a question over there. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I have many questions, but I obviously don't have time to ask them all. Uh, so I wanted to ask about uh, this idea of the, the EU regulation. You mentioned the example of using credit scoring, for example, to uh, influence behavior. But isn't credit scoring itself influencing people's behavior? Isn't that the whole point? It, I mean, it seems like just having a credit score would actually fall under the, the restrictions here. And, and things like that, but the only thing that makes it maybe not is it's not on a computer platform, so it's not quote unquote AI, but of course it's all the same types of algorithms and black boxed and whatnot. And it seems like there are many things like that, like just market research, like for-profit market research or customer profiling or just you know college admissions that are all similarly designed and implemented. And I'm curious, is there a specific exemption for that or have they essentially written a regulation that makes no sense if you understand how computers work. So 
I guess this question is for me on the AI Act. I mean, this is all brand new, and the next few years, all of this is going to be interpreted and implemented, and the whole ecosystem is going to build up to answer the questions similar to the one you just asked. Um, the general approach is if an AI system is a high risk, if it's already part of some regulatory environment, for instance, medical devices, or maybe credit scores, probably, then they will not have an additional assessment requirement introduced by the AI Act. These assessments will be folded into whatever assessment already exists in that particular industry. Um, I guess that's the answer to that specific question. Um, yeah, thank you for all these um, interesting views on your, um, also on the individual legal systems. And um, I'm really wondering, um, how can we do global DH if we have so many different legal systems um, that may seem to make it very complicated? And also, um, I have the honor and sometimes pain to, to teach like uh, legal aspects in open science um, to more research data stewards. And they are sometimes very frustrated and say like, there is a, a legal push to more open, but also um, the legal system makes it more and more complicated. So I would be really interested in the panelists to um, comment on that. Yeah, I have a very short answer to that, uh, incomplete answer, but anyway. Um, I think there is globally uh, emerging um, the idea that we need an exemption f for uh, text and data mining and fair use of data in research. <laughs> uh, the, the, the problem is mainly not so much in uh, the idea that you know, there should be an exception, but in implementing it. There are all kinds of different regulatory mechanisms that are being put in place in different countries, uh, and they should be streamlined. And I think what we should do is we should, through our academic organizations, be pressing for legislation that is more uniform across countries. Uh, I, I, I have a thought to share about the first part of your question about its lack of harmonization uh, worldwide. Uh, I would tend to see the glass as uh, half full rather than half empty. Uh, I think that compared to many other areas of law like contract law, uh, copyright law and various legal frameworks that affect uh, research data are actually pretty harmonized already uh, in copyright, as you know, harmonization. Uh, first efforts in towards harmonization date back to the 19th century. Uh, and um, the, the fact that we can actually have a conversation about copyright between like people from different European countries, but also from with people from the US, and that we have the notion of a work, notion of an author. Uh, we have more or less a notion of an exception or limitation to the exclusive right. We have the notion of the exclusive right of reproduction. We agree on the term of protection, that is 70 years after the death of the author in most countries, with some rare exceptions. Um, it's that these are tremendous achievements, I think. So yeah, I, I, I would say, uh, as far as copyright goes, um, and data protection is much younger than copyright, but it's the same thanks to the GDPR. Um, the, glass is, the glass is half full, so. Thank you for that positive emotion. Kim, did you want to say a word about this? So I, I wanted to just add also one caveat there, and one of the challenges is that we do have different sources of copyright law in different countries in particular. So we've got the European concept of droit d'auteur, which is very much about authors' rights, and then we've got copyright, which is the right to reproduce. So those are two different sort of perspectives on it, and along with the droit d'auteur countries, which actually to an extent includes Canada because of its dual civil and common law heritage, 
there is that notion of moral rights, which also does create some challenges in some jurisdictions um, that are not present in, um, in those jurisdictions do, that do not have as extensive moral rights. So there is, there is that little bit of an issue. But I think the general point, I think, is right. And we do have, you know, for better or for worse, there is a push toward harmonization. And usually the stronger voices are the ones that get the 70 years plus life when Canada has to concede away the 50 years um, in order to get a trade agreement done. But um, the, in, I just wanted, one of the things I didn't get to mention was when, when it comes to AI. So right now the US Copyright Office has uh, launched an artificial intelligence initiative in March. And um, they've had a series of webinars and consultations that are open to the public. And I think in fact in about two weeks or, or a week, I can't remember where we are, there's one that's specifically about this international context and how can we be more harmonious when it does come to questions like you know, Eric's presentation, these um, AI directives and how the globe should sort of try to be a little bit consistent on this. I was like, I, um, I hear the call for homogenization, but I actually think there might be power in it being heterogeneous across environments. Um, sometimes there's rules or laws that are really slowing down. They're for good reasons for that context, but actually are not great for other contexts. And there can be power in another country or another area having rules that let you do something you can't do in your own. And that's why working collaboratively across national boundaries in DH can be so important. It's because you might be able to do some kind of research here that's not possible here, you know, in another location for a while, and that law hasn't caught up yet or whatever it might be. So I actually think one of the powers of knowing everyone's uh, legal frameworks and context is that it might be a spot of international collaboration, depending on your area of research, that our knowledge of each other really can help us further the field uh, among all these different laws and make things possible that may not be possible in some places. So I think that there's some power in the heterogeneity sometimes that might open things up for us. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so guys, it is now 12.30. Um, we're happy to stay for a while with Q&A, but uh, we just wanted to make note of the time. Us chairs in selecting this format, these legal issues panels are almost more important for the connections we're gonna make in the hallways after this than what happens in the Q&A. That's why we really loaded it up with speakers. Um, but it is 12.30, but we're gonna stick around if anyone else has a question, please. All right, well, I do have a question, and I'm sorry, it's a bit of a broad one, but while you are all together, I'd love to ask, back to the topic of copyright and digital rights management, I feel like uh, the digital rights management mechanisms were designed to protect creators uh, and authors' rights, but it really seems to me that in the last 10 years specifically, it's really more become a mechanism for companies to limit user access and get more money. So how can we build a system that is protecting our creators and making sure they're being compensated without allowing for these abuses? I don't know, Quinn or Pavel, did you want to say a word about this? Or, or anyone? I'm sorry? Please. That is the big question, and that's why, you know, I, with libraries, we've gone to the Supreme Court of Canada a couple of times to try to get at, to try to let the court know what these real issues are, as they are commercial interests that are being protected. And so these, you know, any piece of legislation that actually allows um, uh, the copyright law to override the terms, the limiting terms of a contract is a huge win. <laughs> um, but it is, it is really uh, challenging and it's one of the issues that I think a lot about, even when it comes to AI and the things that we're hearing now about um, protecting copyright protected content that's used as training data. Um, what about all the other content that just little lowly individuals like us have created that have become training data? The, suddenly, in, um, you know, they're interested when the copyright holders, the, the big corporate copyright holders, are bringing this issue forward. But what about all those decades when we were, you know, those of us who were trying very hard to protect our data from being used co for commercial purposes by um, conglomerates were not um, able to do so successfully? No one was really listening to that, but uh, there are all kinds of consultations about it now.
Uh, thank you. Um, I have a very uh, uh, concrete question considering the language models, um, because um, I think last month in the uh, Conference of Computational Literary Studies, there was a paper published. It's called uh, Infbert, uh, Reconstructing Text from context Contextualized Word Embeddings by Inverting the BERT Pipeline. So basically, in the paper, it, it has been showed uh, un under, under certain conditions, uh, the original text could be reconstruct using the language model. So does this, this mean that the whole Hugging Face uh, web website is in danger, or? Anyone want to tackle that one? Yes. Take a couple. There you go. Yes, well, I, actually, I, uh, I, I uh, just before leaving to Graz, I finalized and sent a paper to, um, to, to a publisher about um, the, the the use of snippets of text in the context of copyright. So I have this all very fresh in my memory. And there is, uh, in the InfoPack case, uh, what is often overlooked, uh, but it's definitely there. So InfoPack is the, a very important 2009 case from the Court of Justice of the European Union. So it's only valid in the European Union, but in the, the old European Union, all of the European Union. Uh, um, in, in this case, the court said that if snippets allow for large passages of the original of the source text to be reproduced, to be reconstructed, that was the word used, reconstructed, uh, then the use of those snippets can be prohibited by the author of the source text. So, uh, and it's actually quite overlooked. I, you know, this info pack is a decision that I reread a couple of times a, a year. And so I must have read it 20 times or something. And just like last year, I was reading it. So, wow, that's huge. I, I completely forgot it was there, but it's there. Um, written black and white. So yes, so if, um, language models today allow uh, for uh, original text to be easily reconstructed. Uh, I'm afraid it has a tremendous impact on copyright and it opens uh, uh, a lot of potential room for lawsuits uh, against uh, those who train language models, a little bit in the spirit of the Getty Images case. Uh, but w is it going to happen? Are, is everyone, everyone uh, aware of this little uh, paragraph being there in InfoPack? Um, we will live and see. But I, uh, I, I think that there is a substantial danger. Uh, oh, thank you, Pavel. We're now seven minutes over time, so I want to make sure we're respecting the time of everyone and the time of the staff. Um, so I just wanted to make sure all the panelists had a, a chance to say one thing. So Quinn and Kianori, uh, we haven't heard from you two yet. Did you have a, a comment that you wanted to share before we wrap up? Um, th th thank you for all the interesting presentation and uh, co questions. So, so uh, um, yeah, so it's so inter so important to share uh, the the legal issues in DH globally. Uh, it's at least it's very uh, useful, helpful, and informative for um, um, activities in DH in Japan. Thank you very much. Yeah, and there's it's clearly interesting times for uh, copyright issues uh, when it with regard to DH. It's, it's and when, it was talking with Eric yesterday, waiting for the the trolley about you know what the the AI hearings might do in terms of the possibility of renewing our exemption, let alone expanding it. Um, it it's hard to say where this is gonna go, but um, yeah, I guess we'll all we'll all see and advocate where we can. Thank you so much to the speakers. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone. We'll continue these discussions in the hallways. Thank you.